Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture, and today we got something special, another top 10 list, the top 10 best hit songs of 1993. So I'll freely admit that of the Patreon requested years for which I cover the year-end Hot 100, best or worst, we haven't really encountered a bad year for the charts. The sort of years that even with the benefit of hindsight or nostalgia causes kind of to wince in the face of the memories. The closest I've ever covered in this territory throughout the five years I've been on YouTube has probably been 2016, and then maybe either 2010 or 2014, and even then both the latter have strong enough redeeming moments to knock them into quality, at least in my books. 1993? not exactly one of those years. Perhaps not the worst the Hot 100 has had to offer, there are worse years on the charts, but definitely the sort of transitional early 90s year where the best stuff was not charting, most of the good stuff was starting to get really overexposed, music legends were falling apart in slow motion, and the rest was a wasteland, a formless mush. Thank God R&B and New Jack Swing were mostly holding up, and that G-Funk was cutting a swath across hip-hop because rock had lapsed into parody, the pop rapper of the early 90s was trying and failing to keep up, and punk, country, nowhere to be seen, despite the advent of Riot Girl and the neo-traditional country revival in full swing. Even grunge, widely hailed as a breakthrough sound by music critics of the early 90s, it had little to no traction on the charts in 1993. And before hip-hop can raise the triumphant flag here, there was no way in hell that the true best and classics of the genre were getting to pop radio in the face of an avalanche of easy listening pablum left over from the 80s, and artists who should really know better. Yeah, we weren't getting In Utero, but we weren't getting 36 Chambers or Ain't No Other or Balloon Mind State here either. But hey, you got yourself Kenny G. Isn't that good? Right? Now what this means is that the best of 1993 Look, it's all over the place, especially as some of the chart oddities have aged a little bit better than what was big at the time. And while there are a few classic cuts from this era that we will get to, in comparison to stronger years, this particular top 10 feels substantially shakier. And as always, the songs had to have debuted on the year-end Hot 100 in 1993, which actually didn't result in any cuts from this list, and thank God for it, as this is pretty thin overall. But hey, let's start off with number 10. So as I said, despite what was happening off the charts, rock in 1993 on the Hot 100, it was bad. If it wasn't tumbling toward trends that would make adult alternatives such a frustrating genre, it was falling into self-parody. Yes, grunge was a cultural force, but it hadn't really gained a foothold yet, and that meant desperate radio consumers were trying to convince themselves that the gin blossoms were any good. Alright, bad joke crib from Stephen Hyden aside, and the gin blossoms were more average than outright bad, there are two exceptions to that rule that made this list. One that actually leaned into the trends of the time to spectacular results, while the other kind of transcended them to become something of an alternative staple, for better or worse. And here's that song. You know, it's hard to talk about the Four Non Blondes with the benefit of hindsight. The band put out one record that got middling reviews before frontwoman Linda Perry went solo and became the reason you actually remember a fair few pop artists in the mid-2000s, especially Pink and Christina Aguilera. But what's going on has endured, and I will freely admit some of my fondness for the song likely comes from karaoke bar overexposure slash Stockholm Syndrome. But even going beyond that, and all those hacky worst songs ever list that this went Wound up on, there is a certain adolescent appeal to a song like this. The jangling college rock acoustics, the grunge sizzle, Linda Perry's throaty delivery, and the fact that the lyrics... Alright, you can definitely make the argument that they almost read like a parody of 90s alternative message songs, but I'm also not going to deny that there's something kind of cathartic in the stoned out confusion and hope for something better, whatever the hell that might be and whatever it might mean. But again, it was the 90s. This sort of attitude flew far with a certain demographic. And when we consider the sorry state of rock on the charts, you know what? I'll take whatever I can get. Number 9. Alright, look, y'all know the hip-hop that I like and review highly on my list. If it wasn't gonna make my list this song, there was gonna be a problem. The Uber of the styles like miles and shit. Like 60s funky worms with waves and perms. Just sending junky rhythms right down your block. We beat to rap what key beat to lock. But I'm cool like that. I'm cool like that. I'm cool like that. I'm cool like that. 
cool like that. I'm cool like that. I'm cool like that. I'm cool like that. I'm cool. To see digital planets on the Hot 100 kind of blows my mind, because this is the sort of effortlessly textured, forward-thinking, and jazz-inflected hip-hop you hear nowadays from a label like Mellow Music Group, not as a charting hit on the Hot 100 that people listen to on the radio. And while Digital Planets didn't really last long as a group out of the mid-90s, Rebirth is slick, cool like that. It's a sort of song that's got just enough of a pop focus to sneak onto the charts as their biggest and really only hit. The killer bass line, the echoing snap, the horn sample that screams New York alternative hip-hop and shows the DJ premiere influence even then, and the effortless cool that coasts through all three MCs' delivery that almost keeps you from noticing how many rhymes that butterfly is flubbing on the first verse. Thankfully, Ladybug and Doodlebug bring back the slightly sharper flows, but never to the point of being kind of showy or oversold, and thus, despite a well-deserved Grammy win that year, Digital Planets would not survive much longer as gangster rap overran the Hot 100, confining their brand of jazzy experimentation to the underground and critical acclaim, and leaving the more ambitious follow-up blowout comb full of actual live instrumentation and social commentary to flounder without a lot of label support. Now all this leaves a cut like Rebirth a slick cool like that to serve as an like open question of what might have been if this has gotten bigger on the Hot 100, but as somebody who really loves this timbre of hip-hop, I'm grateful it's here regardless. Definitely check it out, it's underserved. Number 8. You know, it's funny in a twisted way that we go from digital planets to the wave of hip-hop that would overrun them. From New York to LA, from jazz rap to gangster rap, and this up-and-coming legend's first ever crossover hit. You might have heard of them, once or twice. So I'm not gonna front. While nobody could question Biggie was the more complex lyricist, I've always preferred Tupac as the artist. The natural charisma and charm that drips through every line as he plays the guy taking your girlfriend but can't be tied down. The sort of material that would normally drive me off the wall, but what Tupac and Digital Underground understood even then was framing. Unlike so many of the modern take your girl bars, he's not playing this as a story of alpha male dominance over the other guy, but as the chill, self-deprecating Casanova who and lean into the swagger driven off the scratchy samples and richly textured but really wiry groove. Hell, he even gives respects to the guy trying to hold on to their girls who are running after him. Also, he actually sounds like he's having fun playing off the faint touches of piano, which feeds nicely in a Shock G Snoop Dogg impression that he is working to the bone on the hook. It's chill, not quite G-funk, but playing into the same vibes that would come to infuse Tupac's later work in this lane. Again, the potential, it seemed endless. And the influence going forward? Hell, song like this, undeniable. Number seven. There is a complicated conversation surrounding the legacy of Janet Jackson that I don't think has received the fair consideration that it really deserves, especially when you consider how hard she was pushing R&B in the late 80s and early 90s, where her brother was starting to flounder despite a lot more commercial success. And while Rhythm Nation 1814 is probably still my favorite of her albums, a self-titled follow-up landed in 1993 and produced a wealth of hits over the next couple of years. And while we will be talking about one of her other big hits later on, this was one of two number one ones and one that might ring as a bit more divisive, especially among critics. And yet... Yeah, you know what, if you think this is the only sappy love ballad that's gonna make my list, you'd be wrong. Come on, it's me. And you know what? I get the criticisms of this song. In comparison with the more experimental R&B that Janet Jackson was making at the time, this is a step towards the sort of treacly, sanitized, easy listening that swallowed up peers like Whitney Houston in that era. But there are three keys to why again works as well as it does. The first coming in a lot of the production and melodic foundation coming out of the pianos. Once again, working Terry Lewis and Jimmy Jack, they give the song the sort of soft focus and maddeningly catchy central melody to support Janet Jackson's hush but heartfelt delivery. And the second piece, it comes in the lyrics. Janet doesn't really want to fall back for this guy, as there are plenty of overheated memories that are lingering in her mind, and yet it's not until we get the final lines that she realizes that she's going to bear it all on the line, and then possibly in losing it all over again. And the third key, 
chance delivery. Yeah, it's emotive, it's vulnerable, but it feels real, and it never feels oversold. A moment where her characteristic tightness and restraint shows a real crack, which lends to its reality, especially in comparison with her other songs. So, yeah, this is a terrific ballad, absolutely deserves to be remembered a lot better. It holds up. Number six. So with the next two songs, ugh, look, I feel like with all of my top 10 lists, there are the songs to which I agree with a lot of critics, and then there are the songs that would likely get my critic card taken away, and this is the first big one. And to explain why it happened, you need to realize that in 1993, the show Beverly Hills 90210 was a pop culture phenomenon. The show would go on to run 10 seasons and help define the teen soap opera genre we know and uh, love today. But in late 1992, they released a soundtrack, one of a few, and it had multiple hits that made the year-end list in 1993. By all accounts, the soundtrack has aged pretty badly. And unless you're familiar with very early 90s pop, you won't find much to revisit there. But there's one exception, and, uh, well... Okay, you're gonna have to follow me on this one. The woman singing here is Vanessa Williams, model and actress who had suffered a pretty nasty scandal in the 80s, but was rebounding in the Paula Abdul wave in the early 90s. The guy is Brian McKnight, an exceptionally talented R&B singer and multi-instrumentalist who was riding a wave of hype off of a critically adored self-titled debut in 92. Vanessa Williams had contributed backing vocals to that album, so they teamed up for this song, which turned into his first big hit. Williams had gone to number one with Save the Best for Last months earlier. And this is the sort of song that'd be so easy to brand as soundtrack fodder and just moved on. And thus, I was a little bit astounded how much I really like this song. Williams and McKnight have a lot of real chemistry. The foundational piano melody plays off the incredibly rich swell of arranged strings that transitions with a tone of elegance into a much more textured acoustic groove. And it even has a guitar solo. Yeah, that could still happen in R&B at that point. Yeah, the lyrics are abstract to nearly the point of meaninglessness, but the song goes for broke in order to sell those broader platitudes, especially with the shifts in the low end that puts this song absolutely over the top in the final hook, and it makes whatever love is feel so much bigger, so much more heartfelt. It's the definition of a power ballad, and so there's really only one place and one person to go if you're gonna top that. Number five. So I also think there's a larger conversation and critical re-examination of Whitney Houston's work that does need to happen at some point, especially given how so much of the discourse has shifted to give pop and R&B of even that era more of a shot than they even typically got in the late 80s and early 90s. That said, it's not exactly an easy conversation, half because the production drama is surprisingly messy, and half because for as talented as Whitney Houston was as a singer, she did not always get the best material. And in 1992, she really needed to boost. Weird thing to say about one of the best-selling artists of the era, but 1990's I'm Your Baby Tonight did not come close to hitting sales expectations. Well, it's because the album was kind of terrible. So in 92, she became the executive producer and curator of the soundtrack of The Bodyguard, which she also starred in opposite Kevin Costner, which would go on to become the fifth best-selling album of all time, mostly linked to the lead-off cover of I Will Always Love You from Dolly Parton. And yet, even at that time, the song had eclipsed the soundtrack and even really a lot of the movie itself. It was the biggest hit song of 1993, won a bunch of Grammys, and if it hadn't been a cover, it probably would have cleaned up at the Oscars too. So let's talk about what was put forward for the Academy Award nomination instead. So I'll be blunt and say it. I'm not the biggest fan of Whitney Houston's cover of I Will Always Love You. I gotta be honest, I prefer Dolly Parton's original, and decades and thousands of karaoke and American Idol covers later, the luster has faded a little bit. Now, the song I love from the Bodyguard soundtrack was I Have Nothing, which plays in a ton of the same territory as the big hit, but it's always felt like a much more dynamic song for me. Whitney Houston handles the balance between raw force and cooing sensuality a lot more effectively, against the gleaming keys and 
flashes of brassy synth and the choppy electric guitar then I'm always a little bit surprised to hear buried within that mix and there is something about the song that feels a little bit more desperate and urgent to me the language is a little broader the pre-chorus build is more impressive and I absolutely love how well it transitions into a very different melodic progression on that hook and of course, it was the 90s, it's the key change. Yes, they were gratuitous in the 90s, mostly thanks to artists like Whitney Houston and all her descendants, but there is a reason why the songs of that era hold so much melodic punch nowadays. Most modern pop doesn't even try to get that dynamic, and Whitney Houston knocks it out of the park here. So yeah, this is probably the other song for which some critics would give me the side eye, but hey, I still love it. It's definitely worth that critical re-examination. Let's have the conversation. Number four. Okay, so one trend that became endemic on the Hot 100 in 1993 was the sudden charting return of a lot of stars from previous decades. And let's be honest, most of them did not turn out all that well. Yeah, I've got a soft spot for Billy Joel's River of Dreams, but the rig returns for Sting, Tears for Fears, Tina Turner, and a fair few more just did not resonate for me. Hell, even Michael Jackson and Prince were kind of sounding a little left behind in 1993. And the only reason Madonna wasn't was because she transitioned into making a adult contemporary mush. Above average adult contemporary mush, but still not what's going to make this list. Of course there were exceptions. Both of which made this list and were both considered has-beens by industry insiders, while the management company handling both of them struggled to get their records to market and get anybody in the industry to care. Now as it happens, when the music's good enough, the consumers don't give a shit. And thus... But I won't for yesterday I have a complicated relationship with Duran Duran, most because the synth pop that they popularized was not the stuff I gravitated towards going back to the 80s. I like the weirder and more gothic stuff, and whenever Duran Duran tried that style, they did not hit great results. They were no Depeche Mode in that lane, and hell, most of the time Depeche Mode was not Depeche Mode in that lane. Keep in mind Duran Duran had hit a serious slump in the late 80s, and their album Liberty before this had been savaged by critics as an incoherent disaster, and they were right. But taking a hiatus allowed them to refine their self-titled album and its tremendous lead-off single, Ordinary World. And what I love about the song is how unlike it is to so many of Duran Duran's biggest hits coming out of the 80s. It's more introspective, it's a little bit more serious. Instead of the hyper-stylized veneer of their 80s coolness, it's a little bit more grounded with its prominent ascending acoustic melody, the arranged swells, the spacious vocal mixing, and the perfectly placed solos. It was a sort of transitional pop rock cut that showed for a fleeting moment how Duran Duran could have lasted into the coming decade, which they promptly squandered. Go figure. Number three. So I can only imagine that some of you are wondering why a certain G-Funk record that dominated 92 and 93 hasn't been mentioned all that much yet. There's a reason for that, and if you've been following me since 2015, you might know why, so might as well say it now. Dr. Dre's The Chronic, while widely considered as one of the most sonically important records in hip-hop of that era and otherwise, it's not aged as well as you remember. Yes, I love G-Funk production, I love those smooth grooves and Dr. Dre's authoritative bars. Even if he didn't write them, he sounded great on them. But what most people tend to forget about that era was N.W.A.'s public implosion and the beefs they definitely spread onto the albums almost to a distracting degree. And while 2015 Straight Outta Compton would try to tell you otherwise, Dre got involved just about as much on The Chronic, and a lot of it comes across as really pissy and really homophobic, which is a big reason that Dre Day is not making this list. Same deal with Ice Cube's Check Yourself for the record. And yes, I get it was a different time, I understand that, but the AIDS crisis was still happening, and it wasn't like most of the actual content on The Chronic was a lot better. That said, there was always going to be one big exception. If it's good enough to get broke off a proper chunk I take a small piece of some of that funky stuff It's like this and like that and like this, Santa It's like that and like this and like that, Anna It's like this and like that and like this, Santa Drake creep to the mic like a fan The lead-off single that put the chronic on the map and introduced much of the world to an up-and-coming superstar by the name of Snoop Doggy Dog. Yes, I know that Deep Cover was first, but this was the smash hit Less than a year before Doggy Style would blow up in its own right, he shows up with Doggy 
Dr. Dre to deliver some of the most effortless cool ever put on a wax with nothing but a G thing. And in comparison with so much of the rest of the chronic, it has aged amazingly well. All straightforward flexing that is endlessly quotable even to this day. And as much as I love Dr. Dre's phenomenal bass grooves, the whirring accents and the scratches, the swampy funk guitar and the keening synths, this is Snoop Dogg's track through and through. Showing the effort and force of personality that made Snoop such a powerhouse before he settled into his groove as hip-hop's perpetually stoned uncle and made a career of not trying ever again. Almost a shame, really, because when Snoop Dogg really does try, he's got that raw charisma and impeccable command of groove and flow that put us on just over the top like this. One big reason why I love One Shot, One Kill when he showed up to return the favor for Dreon Compton decades later. But look, you don't need anybody else to tell you that this is a hip-hop classic. Really? I wouldn't disagree. Kick-ass song. Number two. And here comes a song that's a surprise to precisely nobody who knows me and what I guess anybody who's familiar with the 1993 Hot 100 would assume would be my top pick. And really, it was close. The other big rock song. The number one hit that this artist has never received before, even in his heyday. A song that might have seemed like over-the-top camp and parody even before they got Michael Bay to direct the music video. And hell, you all know what it is. And I would do anything for love. I'd run right into hell and back. I would do I'll never lie to you when that's a fact I have said this before, but the original Bad Out of Hell album is a 10 out of 10 classic. And while the follow up in 1993 is not quite there, it's damn close. A reunion of vision and execution between Meatloaf and producer songwriter Jim Steinman to take the over the top teenage melodrama to the grandest heights yet again. Sure, it's campy, it's borderline musical theater at points, but the operatic scope and the utter commitment from everybody involved, they allowed them to sell it in ways that were shamelessly uncool but emotionally gripping all the same. And the lead-off single, I Do Anything For Love But I Won't Do That, it is a masterstroke. The roaring guitars that open up the song that meant to sound like a motorcycle, the stunning piano work, the huge solos, and Meatloaf bringing his titanic presence to bear in a song that is all whirling angst and earnest passion. And what I've always found so amusing is how many people question what that is. Most because Jim Simon was always candy enough to leave it kind of ambiguous and deepen the song's mimetic appeal even then. But the meaning, it's in plain sight if you listen to the song, as the uncredited Lorraine Crosby delivers her duet coda and asks questions of what Meatloaf can really deliver for her, really bring that love, and then she turns away to know that, in the end, he'll be back to screwing around, and the mature weariness in her delivery is a perfect contrast to Meatloaf's protest that he won't. And there is a wistful part of you and her that so desperately wants to believe it. That's what gives the song its power. It's a rock opera in microcosm. It's one of my all-time favorites, but it's not my top pick for 93. And before we get to that, some honorable mentions. You know, it's kind of funny how often PM Dawn kind of falls out of R&B conversations in the early to mid-90s. Most because they were so restrained and chill. Almost music that slides into the background so effortlessly that you forget about them. And while I'd argue their music that charted in 92 was a little better, Looking Through Patient Eyes is a beautiful little tune. Great harmonies, phenomenal blissed out vibe, the muted rap verses, some stunning melodic touches in the background, and the sort of song that could be meditative, but also have some of that real pop crossover. Solid as hell song. Definitely worth remembering. So 
Well, I bet there are some of you who are surprised this is not on the list proper from the polar opposite side of the spectrum of the last song. And yeah, while I do genuinely love the Proclaimers for their terrific melodies, the defiantly Scottish delivery, and lyrics that often punched way higher than anybody would expect, a lot of people forget how political the Proclaimers often got in their albums. I'm Gonna Be 500 Miles is more meme than song at this point, and even if it wasn't, it is a lesser cut from the band in my view, even from that album. Sunshine and Leaf is a better song. Still great though, making the list. So I was debating whether to put this or Ace of Bases All That She Wants in this slot. But at the end of the day, even if I do think Janet's voice is mixed a little bit too low against the more aggressive driving grooves, If is a far more dynamic and potent song, showing an artist continuing to push the boundaries of R&B into noisier, rougher territory with a heavily distorted guitar, what sounds like a cello sawing into the melody, slamming percussion, and convincing steps into industrial and even trip-hop sounds that Nine Inch Nails would not bring to the mainstream for another five years. When you combine it with Janet Jackson's increased comfort with open sexuality, this is open proof that she was pulling the sound of R&B and dragging the mainstream, kicking and screaming with her. And all the better for it, because this song kicks ass. There was an overabundance of vocal, harmony-rich R&B groups to choose from from 93. And I'd be lying if I said that Silk was great even from that era. The production's not great, it's not especially dynamic in comparison with anything that Voice of Men put out that year, and the lyrics are borderline parody in how nakedly sexual they were, even at the time. And believe me, the R&B trend of spoken word verses that was something that kinda had to die coming out of the 90s. But I also can't deny that I really like the song, the hook is great, and I like that the song leans into the dreamier keys against the deeper bassy drum patterns. Yeah, it's totally silly. You can't take it seriously, but in a fun way, still works. Check it out. So here's the other big R&B group number that landed a slot here, and arguably the more controversial one. This was Shy's biggest ever hit, and while they notched a fair number of singles in 93 on the year end, this is really the only one that sticks with me, pretty much entirely because of the vocal harmonies and that hook. And if I'm being brutally honest, it's probably the only song that I would ever seek out from them. The group had better than average production, sure, and some really stunning vocal arrangements, but the songwriting never played to their strengths, and even on this song, there are traces of that smarmy self-satisfaction that really grated on some of their later singles. Still, I'm a sucker for stunning vocal harmonies, and in 93... This was one of the best. So I've seen Ray Shrimmer compared to Criss Cross a number of times from a number of critics, so I wanted to use this opportunity to go back and see if some of that comparison was valid. And my conclusion is as follows. Holy shit, Ray Shrimmer wishes they were this good. Yeah, the Super Cat sample's doing a lot of heavy lifting on the hook, and the diss to the Da Youngstas didn't quite hold up as well when they took on another bad creation a few years earlier, but the bass groove is terrific, and while the song is trying to be a little bit more street in order to change with the times, it doesn't quite oversell what Criss Cross is at that time. Plus, both Daddy Mac and Mac Daddy really ride this beat really damn well. The song seems to be a fan favorite, even after Da Bomb didn't really quite do as well as pop rap was getting pushed out and I kind of see why this is a good song. Check it out. All 
All right, look, if it did not put Mariah Carey on this list, I'd wind up getting lynched in an alley. But it's not like I really disagree. Music Box is the first Mariah Carey album I actually really liked. And while both Daydream and Butterfly are better albums, Dream Lover is a great sensuous cut that's not remotely deep. But when you have Mariah Carey cooing with such happy exuberance, it doesn't really need to be. Factor in production that is not aged at all and a genuinely good groove and yeah, really good song. I'm not complaining. And finally, to wrap this up, number one. Look, it was either going to be this or Meatloaf at the top of this list, and this song, it really was no question. The competition for this upper echelon was not there for me. Both songs for me are damn near classics for very different reasons. But ultimately, this one out with the fact that while i do anything for love is not the sort of song I could listen to anytime, anywhere. It absolutely crushes the right time and the right place. But then you got the one song that works at any time or any place. Well... Freaking brothers every way like MJ. I can't believe today was a good day. The guitar-driven groove and the vocal sample is impeccable and wonderfully textured, containing an edge but also the sort of relief that comes with a long exhale, the unexpected feeling of things actually going right when they so rarely do. A meandering song taking us through Ice Cube's life where everything that could go wrong doesn't. And there's a strange sense of bemused confidence that fills the song. He's living as a gangster, sure, nothing all that different's happening, and there's definitely illegality going on, but for one day it's all going right. And while the cops and the violence, they're always in view in the periphery, it almost seems like the day is open and free for once. And what's astounding is how well the song has aged and feels so relevant even today. Sure, some of the references might feel a little bit dated, but the feeling of going on a hot streak where he's killing it on the ball court, the dice are coming in his face, and he's always got a girl to see just before he goes out and gets a burger. And you know what, for once, he doesn't have to think about himself or a friend or an enemy getting killed. And that sense of peace in the face of relative normality that I and so many white people take for granted in North America right now really makes you cherish what you have. It makes you seriously question why Ice Cube's good days can't be the norm for everybody. Even at the end of the song where Ice Cube snaps away to realize that so much of the song, just a dream. Which fits the darker progression in the melodic sample as ever constant subtext that colors, but never overwhelms that sense of relief and peace that he has. But L, you all know it's a hip hop classic. It's a major touchstone quoted to this day. And I got no problem calling It Was A Good Day, the best hit song of 1993. Until then, I'm Mark. You're watching Spectrum Pulse. Peace out.